But the next time you have to do this so-called dirty work, this work that you think is above you, realize, particularly if it's related to your career, it can give you a sense of humility, insight, and perhaps even grace that you wouldn't find otherwise. Hi, my name is Damon Brown, DamonBrown.net. My main thing is help you as a side hustler, solopreneur, otherwise a non-traditional entrepreneur. Today we're gonna to talk about Rick Ross, a famous rapper, now best-selling author, a plethora of things, including getting his own artists out. He's known as the boss, down, particularly down in Miami, Florida, where he's based. And he was recently talking about how he cuts his own grass. This is important <laughs> because by most accounts, he's worth about eight, maybe nine figures at this point, but let's just say eight figures. And he lives on a palatial estate, I believe called the Promised Land, right outside of Atlanta. So he's based in Miami, but he has a major mansion, compound, whatever you want to call it, over or right outside Atlanta, Georgia. He cuts his own grass. This is important for several different reasons, particularly we often believe that we should um, pass on or um, uh, outsource, whatever term you want to use, when we get to a certain stature, because we believe that we need to be focused on the vision versus doing the work. But there's a few reasons why you actually might want to consider doing the dirty work yourself. Again, my name is Damon Brown, DamonBrown.net. You're watching the Bring Your Worst Show every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 11.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, Vegas time. It's always feel free. Feel free to subscribe. All right, so Rick Ross, he cuts his own grass. He was talking to the people over at Earn Your Leisure. I've mentioned them a few times. I love the work that they do. It's at EarnYourLeisure.com. They have video as well as a podcast. He was talking to them. And he was saying that to get his grass cut, I believe on the compound, it would have cost, I don't know, five figures. But I mean, he's got like probably a few hundred acres. So it's reasonable to do five figures. He said, absolutely not. Instead, he got two of his friends, colleagues, maybe people that work with him, and he got himself. He connected with John Deere. He mentioned him specifically, <laughs> and he's a big guy. So he got the, the, the sit down lawnmowers for himself and presumably his other friends who are probably around the same size he is. And they spent an afternoon or whatever and cut the lawn. Now on some level, this sounds like ridiculous. Like again, if you're making six, seven figure deals, you're worth eight figures, which you know would be about worth in the tens of millions, I'd say, then why the heck are you cutting your own grass? Now I've written about this in a few different publications written about it in my ink column at inkdamonbrown.com. I have about 600 columns on there. Feel free to check it out. I also talk about this in The Ultimate Bites of an Entrepreneur, which y'all made a bestseller, so thank you. I talk about how Bill Gates doesn't cut or shouldn't cut his own grass because his hourly rate, you know, even though he's retired now, his hourly rate is probably the equivalent of about $100,000. You can say, for the time that's being spent, you're cutting your grass, which you can get someone else to do for, say, $15 an hour maybe cheaper. But then Bill Gates could actually be creating, say, the next Microsoft, which would be worth a heck of a lot more. But Rick Ross cutting his own grass actually kind of makes sense. And there's two big reasons for it. The first reason is that when you get down and dirty, as, as you might want to put it, then you're actually able to see the process. When you think about um, generational wealth, when you think about the things that are passed on, when you think about the things that are given to you, that you didn't have to work for, there's often a knowledge gap when it comes to that. I've listened to a lot of millionaires, even billionaires that have talked about this, where they're not sure because they grinded it out, they hustled, they earned, for lack of a better term, that money to get their family to where they are. And they have nieces, nephews, maybe their own kids, maybe even grandkids that didn't have the same path. Because obviously they're millionaires or billionaires, whatever, that epoch of success is they already hit it. But they hit that success and learned all the lessons ideally along the way. The people who are a degree away from, or what degree or two away from that don't have that, right? So as you start to get more successful, even if you're the one on that journey of success, you start to get removed from the actual process. So if you're making these big deals, if you're on the big vision of wherever this, this business is going, but then you don't understand the intricacies of it, or you start to forget them, 
then that could be a dangerous position to be because that's when you start to misalign with the work that you're doing. Have you ever heard of like a CEO, a founder, a leader, or even someone that's like a manager or something like that, a higher up in the company who started from the bottom and they got to here and they started to forget the front line, forget the, 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 the details, forget the process. And that's only if you're lucky. For some folks, they get right into that high position and they never understand the process. One of the beautiful things I was able to experience with specifically my journalism career is seeing how everything was made. I became a journalist when I was, oh my gosh, 13, 14. I just, I just hit puberty and I became a journalist. I'm well, well past that. And so I became a journalist when I was in high school and I was able to do all these different positions from news editor to features editor to being the right-hand man of the publisher um, to all these different positions. And so now I'm a full-time freelance writer. So I create things, I write regularly for Playboy, I write for ARP the Magazine, Costco, Connections, all these major publications. I'm coming at them as a writer, but I'm bringing all the experience. And so when I pitch them an article, when I write an article, when they tell me that they need a certain deadline, when I'm negotiating a certain pay, I know how the sausage is made from being a writer, which is what I do now, all the way to being the right-hand person of a publisher everything in between. The beautiful part about that is that you understand the system. When Rick Ross is negotiating with John Deere for them to send him, you know, three or four of their giant tractors, the standalone things, and he understands every nook and cranny and crevice and, and every square foot of his, say, thousand acre palatial estate, that gives him a vision that most people who have an estate like that, and there probably aren't that many, that most of them do not have. How many people are millionaires, billionaires, who cut their own grass? So it allows you to understand the architecture, not just literally <laughs> of the landscape, but also the proverbial landscape and architecture of the work that you're doing. You see the system, not just a small piece that you have in it. And that especially goes for if you're in a position of power and you don't necessarily need to think about those details most of the time. The second part, which I talk about a lot in, again, The Ultimate Bite Size Entrepreneur, my book from a few years back, is that you're actually able to hire other people and then you can lead others. It's really difficult to lead people, to hire people, to uh, galvanize people, to motivate people if you don't understand their job. That's the power of you hear someone saying, okay, they started in the mail room, they started as a a custodial assistant or a janitor. They started um, as a waitress and then suddenly they're CEO of the company. Suddenly they're manager of several of these restaurants. Suddenly they're the principal of the school. The reason why it's such a powerful thing to hear that is because intrinsically we know they understand the system. But then also intrinsically we know, consciously or not, we recognize that if someone's a principal, and they're leading, say, 200 people to an, a staff of 200, they're gonna understand the different body parts of the whole. And so there's a certain amount of respect and leadership they will be able to give, say, the custodial assistant, to give the waitress, uh, to give the person on the front line, the cashier, that most people who did not go through the ranks would be able to give. And it gives, ideally, a sense or an opportunity to be humble and to be thoughtful in your leadership. It gives a level of emotional intelligence that we often end up neglecting if we go, again, we wake up on third base and think we hit a triple. People that come in like that, they don't honor that process as much. It's one of the reasons why I've had my ups and downs. Again, I started this freelance journalism journey many, many years ago, we can say decades now have my ups and downs, have my financial challenges, have my highs and my lows, but I wouldn't trade it for anything because when I'm coaching folks like yourself who are on that particular journey, when I think about all the ups and downs of my two startups I had before I sold the second one and had some success, I'm able to lean on those things, understand ideally where you're coming from to give proper leadership or at least insight and to give a companionship on your journey 
which otherwise I don't think I'd be able to do as effectively. And so if you have to cut your own grass, <laughs> embrace it. As Sin Nan Han talks about, uh, not only in his wonderful book, No Mud, No Lotus, but in his many conversations, you should take joy in washing your dishes as much as you take joy in, say, falling in love. They're both part of the human process. So the next time you have to do this so-called dirty work, this work that you think is above you, realize, particularly if it's related to your career, it can give you a sense of humility, insight, and perhaps even grace that you wouldn't find otherwise. And I, for one, am thankful for the times I was grinding it out in many of the journals and positions I had to getting here. The times when I was coaching people for free just to figure out how the hell I was supposed to do it. And the times that I did books that frankly didn't do that well, but I was able to get insight about the process and that made for bestsellers later. Each of those not only are stepping stones, but are essential pieces of you understanding the whole. And I think that's the part that Rick Ross gets. And for that, I salute him. Bring Your Worth show every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 11.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, Vegas time. Feel free to check out the, uh, the long playlist. I think we're, this is episode 211, 212. I'm losing count, but thank you for all the love and support. If you want to support the channel even more, give a like or subscribe, all free. Also share it with people that you think need to hear the message when it comes to emotional intelligence, when it comes to consistency, when it comes to making an impact on the world and making it better than the one that you came into. Until next time, remember that you can always bring your worth and that you can always build from now. Take care.